Howdy, and welcome to another episode of the Deep Space Travel Break, the only podcast hosted by me, Kanaju, and the only podcast exclusively sponsored by the Deep Space Travel Network. Find your next travel destination with DSTN at deepspacetravelnetwork.com. That's deep-space-travel-network.com. DSTN does not guarantee the accuracy of provided portal coordinates. DSTN is not responsible for accidents involving incorrect portal coordinates or boring vacations involving correct portal coordinates. All right, so on to housekeeping. So this episode is going to be a little different than usual. For one, I haven't done an outline at all. Um, <laughs> I'm just sort of winging it. I'm going to be talking about Expedition 4 today, my initial impressions and thoughts and, and the lore and some of the implications it might have for the game at large. But I also wanted to take this opportunity to catch up on where the channel is. So we have reached 333 subscribers, which is <laughs> it may not sound like a lot, but that's like one third of a thousand. So that's pretty good. And excuse any strange skittering sounds or squeaks or other sound effects you may hear in the background. I'm currently house sitting and I have a dog in one room and my crazy cat in this room. And so uh, they're just sort of, you know, there's a, a tense peace in the air. But thank you so much for supporting my videos. The support for the Spelunky and Space series has been really great to see. So after, after reading some of the comments y'all have put, I'm really excited to announce that I will be renewing it for at least another episode. I'm hoping to do three more episodes. I'm thinking maybe it'll be like a... For the next three, I will go to a red, green, and blue star system. So I just need to record the footage for that and then start editing that together. So hopefully you'll see that soon. Um, I also have some other videos that I've been wanting to work on unrelated to, well, either Frontiers or uh, Emergence. Just some, some general No Man's Sky stuff I think you might enjoy. And then I would also like to go back and continue my all updates reviewed series, but I need to find time for that as those episodes tend to take a very long time. I may end up splitting them a little bit more just to help with that, but we'll see. Anyways, in No Man's Sky news, it's been a big week since the last, uh... <laughs> I'm sorry, my cat is very distracting. It's been a big week since the last podcast. No Man's Sky Emergence released last week, featuring Expedition 4 Emergence. Or rather, Expedition 4 released, featuring a mini update. The update itself had some small fixes and some small visual improvements, which I was really happy to see. I'm always happy when the game starts looking better. But obviously the biggest, the biggest draw of this was Expedition 4 Emergence. Now, I've already completed Expedition 4, and I'll put a link in the description for a quick guide to it that I put together last week, and I'll be getting more to it in this episode, actually. So, besides that, we also have a new experimental branch update in the works. I'll put a link to that as well, but the patch notes are pretty extensive on this one. It looks like it fixes a lot of base building uh, snapping issues. It fixes, you know, not being able to sit in chairs, which broke a few updates ago. It sounds like it'll fix some of the issues I had with my settlement in 3.68, so it sounds like it'll remove the grass from inside of those, but we'll we'll see how, how much good it does. And it has a few other fixes as well. I recommend checking it out for yourself, but I'm assuming we'll see that in patch form, like on uh, consoles and such, probably this week if I had to guess. So look forward to that. But all right, on to our topic of the show. Today we are covering Expedition 4 Emergence, which I, on Twitter, I tried guessing the name of this upcoming expedition or this upcoming update, and I picked every other synonym except for Emergence. So hats off to Hello Games for always coming up with a name that I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect. So. Expedition 4 Emergence, fair warning, we will be covering a lot of spoilers because I'm going to be talking about the structure of the expedition as well as the rewards and the lore. However, if you've already finished it or, you know, the if you're not that bothered by spoilers when it comes to lore, I hope you'll keep listening. 
All right, so Expedition 4 tasks us with a hunt. Oh boy, <laughs> can you hear my cat in the background? I'm so sorry. Tasks us with a hunt. Rather, five hunts, I suppose. And you start off on a desert planet infested with titan sandworms. And by infested, I mean about every 10 seconds there will be a titan sandworm popping out of the ground and causing the screen to shake. Which I, I get could be annoying for some players, but I actually enjoyed it. For the most part, sometimes it got a little too wild. But throughout the expedition, you you have to move from system to system. And you're moving from desert planet to desert planet. Pretty much finding these Titan sandworm burrows. Which are kind of like, pretty much like eggs, visually speaking. And once you get there, they're just filled with these Titan larvae. larvae which are pretty much, I mean... I would say almost the biggest enemies we've ever fought in No Man's Sky, other than maybe the Sentinel Walkers. These are these are pretty big enemies, but they go down really easy. And you go out throughout the galaxy and you're clearing out those nests. And eventually you make it to the end and you present evidence in the form of cursed dust to the Atlas to try and let the Atlas know that there's this infestation. And at first, it seems like the Atlas completely ignores you. But as you're leaving, it actually transfers a piece of tech that allows you to harvest the something spawn. Pretty much uh, the little eggs that appear when you kill them, when you kill the larvae. You're able to collect those after you get the tech from the Atlas. And from a story perspective, like once you finish the expedition, you're left with a lot of lore, but you don't actually do anything with the vile spawn, which is kind of interesting. Overall, I would say this was my favorite expedition, but I do wish it had a little bit more of a conclusion. I mean, I feel like they, they got really close to a, to a satisfying conclusion with this one. Hello, future Kanaju here. I just realized while editing that I forgot to mention, as far as the conclusion goes, the final milestone is to collect those vile spawn, and then the final reward is actually your own Titan Sandworm companion. So I guess the conclusion, they don't do a great job of really making it straightforward or obvious. But if you think about it, after you complete the expedition by collecting the vile spawn, you're then able to raise a worm of your own. So I guess that's a pretty good conclusion. I didn't immediately think of it because I completed mine out of order. So that does put a bit of a dampener on that, but it would have been cool if they had maybe explained it slightly differently or made it more obvious, but maybe that's nitpicking at this point. All right, back to the podcast. The narrative was really fun. At each stage, you're picking up these worm folios and each one of them has a little piece of lore that's talking about this ancient cult that actually worshiped the sandworms. And I won't recount the entire script, but um, basically this cult was presumably on a desert planet. And during the storms, the sandworms would come to the surface. And they ended up worshipping these worms because they were so large and so majestic and so powerful. And their culture eventually adopted a tradition where they would attempt to sacrifice themselves. So if they were digested in their belief system, then they would be reborn as the larva that you see all over the place. So in their minds, you know, if they could be swallowed and digested, then they would grow to be these titan worms themselves. And they could, you know, swim across the, the sands, across the planet. One of the images that I think is really interesting was, you know, one of the, the manuscript describes them standing in lines across the desert with their arms you know outstretched just waiting for the the worms to come and eat them and that's pretty fascinating the only evidence we have of this cult now besides the manuscripts is they actually one of the rewards is a appearance modification that gives you like a sandworm head but it's described as a helmet and apparently it mimics sort of their cultural apparel, which is pretty cool. So overall, I really love this expedition, but what does it mean for the wider game? What does it mean for the future? It only runs for about five weeks, so I think it ends around mid-November, 
It's pretty easy to beat, took me about four and a half hours, but I probably could have shaved an hour off of that just by uh, paying attention to the milestones a little bit better. But what this expedition does really well is it creates not only a narrative, but the milestones themselves are more focused. So in the past, uh, the last three expeditions, all of the milestones sort of seemed like they were just picked at random, you know? Oh, uh, yeah, collect five of these, uh, visit ten of those, uh, shoot nine of these. And, and they didn't really have a, a purpose. Like, you would move from rendezvous to rendezvous, and that always felt really focused. But everything else was sort of just like a, a random grab bag of objectives. And this expedition... Whoops, that was my cat again. In this expedition, we're actually on a hunt. So not only do the rendezvous make more sense because you're moving from cursed planet to cursed planet, sort of clearing out the nests. But then the other objectives are, you know, clearing out a nest. One of the, interestingly, it actually has almost like a side story because you have to get this certain tech in order to access the writhing manuscript. So a few of the objectives are dedicated to going onto a derelict freighter in order to get the tech, the blueprint, in order to unlock a secret archive at one of the planetary archives. And once you unlock that, you're able to read a writhing manuscript. So we have the objectives that are like do a derelict freighter and visit a planetary archive, but they're cleverly reworked into, you know, finding a specific piece of technology that allows you to access a specific archive. So even objectives like that, that might have previously been kind of boring, they're more exciting because it's directly tied into the narrative. And even stuff like visiting an atlas station, which would have been cool, but wouldn't have made much sense in previous expeditions. In this case, you're trying to confront the atlas. And then once you visit the atlas, you get the necessary tech in order to complete the last two milestones. So it all ties in together really nicely. Even little things like their lost children, where you're excavating bones. Like, we've had that objective before, but in this case, just theming it a little bit to be like, oh, you're digging up, you know, the remains of these uh, worms. Like, maybe they're children that, that didn't make it. So, you're tying it in a little bit more. And I think it worked really well. Like, I actually genuinely enjoyed this expedition. I'm actually thinking of running it again just for fun, because unlike the other expeditions, which at times felt like chores, this one felt more like an adventure, and it's the kind of adventure I'd like to go on again. Now, what does this mean for the greater No Man's Sky universe? Well, I don't think the cult will play much into the lore going forward, but the part I was more interested in was the mechanics. So, No Man's Sky very, very, very rarely adds new enemies to the game. In fact, the last time they added a, a ground-based enemy to the game, like a new type, was in 2018 with the next update, when they added Biological Horrors. Uh, that was the last time. So it's been three years since they gave us a new ground-based enemy. And that comes in the form of the... Now what are these things called? The Writhing Tendrils. So I'll just refer to these as baby worms, even though they're quite large. So these guys, they're, they're both really, really, really cool and slightly disappointing. They're really cool because you can actually see them ahead of time. They're kind of like in the ground with their mouths sticking up. <laughs> kind of like you would see like a Sarlacc pit on Tatooine. And as you approach, they just they pop out of the ground and they're, they just tower over you. And if you're close enough, they will they will strike you faster than you would expect. And they're pretty terrifying. They they have these cool animations, and their mouths are like foaming with acid, and they're so cool. Uh, <laughs> they're like no, no other enemy in No Man's Sky. But I say a little bit disappointing because if you stand far enough away from them, they actually they can't hurt you. They don't have a ranged attack, even though they look like they should. Just like the biological horrors, they look like they would be able to spit some kind of acid at you. But I don't think in my playthrough they ever did. So maybe that's something they'll patch in soon. But the other thing that's a little disappointing is 
I visited one of the expedition planets on my normal save, and I visited one of the cursed planets. So when you're in your expedition save, a cursed planet has three interesting properties. One, it's, it's actually marked as worm infested, which is really cool. But what that means is that it spawns not only those tied in worm nests, which have all the little baby worms, but it also adds cursed dust to the planet's attributes. So cursed dust becomes one of the materials that you can actually harvest from the ground. And that's used for a couple of blueprints as well as story moments. And it's pretty cool because it's in the lore, it's explained as like dust that's sort of been touched by some of the slime from the worms. And so it's called cursed dust, although the people from the cult consider it to be holy. But it's a material that you can only gather on these worm infested planets. And of course, additionally, they turn up the worm spawn numbers up to 10. So they're just constantly, every few seconds, you're seeing a giant worm in the background, which is really cool. It gives these planets like a character that makes them feel like unique, even among the rest of the planets in the universe. So the planets I saw in this expedition essentially didn't feel like anything I'd ever seen throughout the rest of my five years playing this, which is something really special. So. I, I love all that. I love that these planets feel unique. The only thing is I wish that this would extend to the base game because when I visited these planets in normal mode, they did not have the worm attribute. They did not have nests. They didn't have cursed dust. They were just regular planets. And that is pretty disappointing because I feel like this is... No Man's Sky so rarely adds new enemies and new mechanics and new materials to the game that when they do go through the trouble of making all this and programming it, and it is as successful as it is, it's it's pretty sad to know that in just a couple weeks time, or I guess like four weeks time, it won't be in the game anymore, which seems like a terrible waste of resources. And I understand wanting to create unique experiences that, you know, once the expedition's over, that's it. But I think for a lot of players, I think most players actually wouldn't mind seeing these very, very, very rarely in the normal universe. So I'm talking like one in every maybe thousand or every 10,000 planets, which sounds very rare, but given the amount of players and the amount of planets, you know, you would eventually see one. And you know, for all I know, maybe they are already in the game and I just haven't come across one yet. But my hope is that they are actually included in the main game because they do add a lot. And for people concerned that, oh, well then what's the point of the expedition? Well, all of the rewards from the expedition are still time locked. So even if this were completed and you know now these worm infested planets are everywhere in the universe starting next month, you know, you still wouldn't be able to unlock the specific companion, the appearance modification and the stickers and other rewards, as well as like the manuscripts and pieces of lore that were only available for the expedition. So that stuff wouldn't carry over. And I think it would be a good mix of, you know, giving players content long-term in addition to giving us something unique to experience for these five weeks. So I personally hope they, they make the decision to include this stuff throughout the entire game, because if not, I, I will be really disappointed when this expedition ends and I can no longer you know, find a planet like this. Because, I mean, honestly, a lot of people were really sold on this game. <laughs> Believe it or not, because of that silly trailer in 2014 with the sandworms in it. People love sandworms on desert planets. You know, it's like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, just look at how successful the Dune movie was this past weekend, which I did see as well. Which, uh, I mean, personally, I think the sandworms are like the coolest part of that. But that's the thing, people love sandworms and desert planets, so now that they have like a specific system in place, it would be a shame to get rid of it. So, besides Expedition 4, what did Emergence bring to the game that we can at least confirm is going to be there? Well, one thing that they covered in their blog post was that it brings more varied sandworms to the game. Now, I love the sandworms that they added in Origins last year, but I did feel like they were a little bit static. They used the existing models from underwater serpents and like floating serpents, and they pretty much just scaled them up, which looks pretty good for the most part, but 
being someone who played the game that long and recognized them, they just felt like they were scaled up creatures, you know. The new sandworms they've designed, they're more animated, which is really cool. But on top of that, they look like giant sandworms. They're more detailed and they're different from the ones you'll see, you know, at normal scale. And I think this really helps sell that they're giant sandworms. Even if they're not more interactive than previously, they look a lot more terrifying. And I, I think this was a welcome addition. I always welcome more variation. And then they also mentioned richer particle effects, which I actually noticed these when I was playing the update even before the patch notes dropped. And I have to say this game is looking better and better every day. I'm not sure how well it translates to older consoles, but on PS5, uh, it looks good. I especially love the new meteorites, which they showcase here, but even seeing them just on a regular playthrough, I feel like their trails look a lot better than they did before. <laughs> So speaking of rewards, I'm going to run down these real quickly. We have the feasting cask, which is the alien head, alien helmet I told you about. And I actually really like the appearance of this. It's kind of ugly. It's kind of gross, but it's also <laughs> really unique. And I have it on my expedition save. I don't have it on my main save, but I'm thinking about it. It's just like a Halloween look. I really like it. And then speaking of which, we have rideable sandworms. Which, I didn't redeem the biological horror on my main save because I, I wasn't really that interested in it. It wasn't procedural, so everyone would have the same one. But this companion, from what I've seen, I think it is procedural. I've seen some people post pictures of theirs online and they look different than the ones I hatched on my main save. Or on my expedition save. So I think I will redeem this one because not only is it really, really cool and kind of gross looking, but it also grows bigger than most companions from what I've seen. So before I hatch it, I'll probably do some genetic modification at the space anomaly to see if I can make it even bigger. But that's something, maybe I'll make a video on that. Oh, okay, so here I see the ghastly trail. And I absolutely love this thing. It's, it's really gross and I don't know why I like it so much. I told my wife it feels like I'm uh, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse because everywhere I fly it's just like a plague, unleashing a plague on the planet, the local ecosystem. And for those of you just listening, basically it's a green jetpack trail, but it's kind of like more of a, I don't know, like a swampy green, almost like bacteria, what you would imagine. And then it shoots out worms, it shoots out these little bugs that fly around. It, it's pretty incredible to see. And even as I play normally, it's just fun to look at every time I jump. So they also included a Titanic trophy, which is like a small version of the Grave of the Ocean King, which I think is really cool and would make a really good addition to Halloween bases as well as desert bases, you know. And then they added the Flesh Launcher, which continues their tradition of giving us fireworks as a <laughs> reward which I'm not the biggest fan of. I, I never use these things. I just hoard them because they're one-time use items. But this one's pretty interesting. It just, it shoots up and then it becomes like a spinny wheel of just shooting flesh everywhere, which is pretty much a similar effect to what we have with the jetpack trail. And then of course we still have the banner, the worm lord title and the sticker for expedition four, which are usually my favorite because I like to make like little displays commemorating each expedition. And that's pretty much it. That's Expedition 4 in a nutshell. I really like this one. It was short but sweet. The kind of thing that I wouldn't mind playing through again. And the fact that they were able to add new enemies and new planet types essentially. New materials and all that stuff to the expedition without regenerating the universe is really exciting for the future. And I hope it's something that they continue to use for future expeditions, but also for future updates, right? Giving us new features and things without having to regenerate everything. I think that's their goal. And I hope we get at least one more update before the end of the year, hopefully utilizing something like this. But what did you think of the expedition? Did you enjoy it? Do you play expeditions? Are you going to ignore it? Did you read the lore? Did you like the new worm enemies? If you haven't given it a shot, if you think expeditions aren't really your thing, I personally recommend it anyways. If only as soon as you spawn, you'll be on the first worm planet. Just go ahead and explore that. 
<laughs> because even if you don't finish the expedition, it is a a once in a lifetime opportunity as far as No Man's Sky is concerned to experience a worm infested planet and it's really worth the time. So let me know in the comments below what you thought and before I close this podcast it's time for a community highlight. So I didn't as going along with the theme of not preparing an outline I didn't prepare a community highlight either so I'm gonna go ahead and highlight Zoo Games again this week because I've been enjoying his content. He recently reached 3,000 subscribers, which congratulations to Zoo. That's really cool. He does streams all the time. He plays a few different games, but I think he mostly does No Man's Sky content. And he's really great. Most of his streams are exploration based, but he also does guides and helpful tips and a lot of really cool base building. So if you're just looking for some chill No Man's Sky content, he also does, you know, speculation and things like that. but. His content is always really well measured and level headed <laughs> to use that adjective. So I, I really enjoy his stuff and I think you might too. But that's it for this week's content. Oh yeah, and link in the description below to Zoo's content. Check him out. But thanks again for watching. I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. Sorry if it's all over the place. I'm sure I'll cringe when I'm editing this, but I was just really excited to talk about this week's expedition. And time's been a little bit tight, so it usually takes me a while to write an outline and, and come up with stuff like that. So by doing this, I was able to get the video to you sooner, but hopefully not for a, a lack of quality. But let me know in the comments below uh, what you think and let me know what kind of content you're interested in seeing. I've seen a lot of y'all talk about wanting to see more content, sort of like the Splunking in Space. Which is great because I actually want to make more content like that. That's my favorite stuff to make. So expect more of that soon as well as some, some new ideas. But uh, thank you so much. Leave a like if you enjoyed the podcast. And if you haven't subscribed yet, you know, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. And I promise to only upload, you know, uh, worthwhile content. I try not to create stuff simply for clickbait or anything like that. My goal is to make content that, you know, I would want to watch on YouTube. So if you think you might be interested in that, then you know what to do. But all right, thanks again, and I hope you have a good one. See ya.